like Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 12 Liking life on my own account no better, I form a great resolution. In due time Mr. Micawber's petition was ripe for hearing, and that gentleman was ordered to be discharged under the Act, to my great joy. His creditors were not implacable, and Mrs. Micawber informed me that even the revengeful bootmaker had declared in open court that he bore him no malice, but that when money was owing to him he liked to be paid. He said he thought it was human nature. Mr. Micawber returned to the King's Bench when his case was over, as some fees were to be settled and some formalities observed before he could be actually released. The club received him with transport, and held a harmonic meeting that evening in his honour, while Mrs. Micawber and I had a lamb's fry in private, surrounded by the sleeping family. "'On such an occasion I will give you, Master Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'in a little more flip, for we had been having some already, the memory of my papa and mamma.' "'Are they dead, ma'am?' I inquired after drinking the toast in a wine-glass. "'My mamma departed this life,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'before Mr. Micawber's difficulties commenced, or at least before they became pressing. My papa lived to bail Mr. Micawber several times, and then expired, regretted by a numerous circle.' Mrs. Micawber shook her head, and dropped a pious tear upon the twin who happened to be in hand. As I could hardly hope for a more favourable opportunity of putting a question in which I had a near interest, I said to Mrs. Micawber, "'May I ask, ma'am, what you and Mr. Micawber intend to do, now that Mr. Micawber is out of difficulties and at liberty? Have you settled yet?' "'My family,' said Mrs. Micawber, who always said those two words with an air, though I never could discover who came under the denomination. "'My family are of opinion that Mr. Micawber should quit London and exert his talents in the country. Mr. Micawber is a man of great talent, Master Copperfield.' "'I said I was sure of that.' "'Of great talent,' repeated Mrs. Micawber. "'My family are of opinion that, with a little interest, something might be done for a man of his ability in the Custom House. The influence of my family being local, it is their wish that Mr. Micawber should go down to Plymouth.' They think it indispensable that he should be on the spot. That he may be ready, I suggested. Exactly, returned Mrs. Micawber, that he may be ready, in case of anything turning up. And do you go too, ma'am? The events of the day, in combination with the twins, if not with a flip, made Mrs. Micawber hysterical, and she shed tears as she replied. <gasps> I never will desert Mr. Micawber. Mr. Micawber may have concealed his difficulties from me in the first instance, but his sanguine temper may have led him to expect that he would overcome them. The pearl necklace and bracelets which I inherited from Mamma have been disposed of for less than half their value, and the set of coral, which was the wedding gift of my papa, has been actually thrown away for nothing. "'But I never will desert Mr. Micawber. "'No!' cries Mrs. Micawber, more affected than before. "'I never will do it. "'It's of no use asking me.' "'I felt quite uncomfortable, "'as if Mrs. Micawber supposed I had asked her to do anything of the sort, "'and sat looking at her in alarm. "'Mr. Micawber has his faults. "'I do not deny that he is improvident. "'I do not deny that he has kept me in the dark as to his resources.' and his liabilities both she went on looking at the wall <laughs> but i never will desert mr micawber mrs micawber having now raised her voice to a perfect scream i was so frightened that i ran off to the club room and disturbed mr micawber in the act of presiding at a long table and leading the chorus of gee up dobbin gee ho dobbin gee up dobbin gee up and gee ho with the tidings that Mrs. Micawber was in an alarming state, upon which he immediately burst into tears, and came away with me with his waistcoat full of the heads and tails of shrimps, of which he had been partaking. "'Emma, my angel!' cried Mr. Micawber, running into the room. "'What is the matter?' "'I never will desert you, Micawber!' she exclaimed. "'My life!' 
said Mr. Micawber, taking her in his arms. I am perfectly aware of it. He is the parent of my children. He is the father of my twins. He is the husband of my affections cried Mrs. Micawber, struggling, and I never will desert Mr. Micawber. Mr. Micawber was so deeply affected by this proof of her devotion, as to me I was dissolved in tears, that he hung over her in a passionate manner, imploring her to look up and be calm. But the more he asked Mrs. Micawber to look up, the more she fixed her eyes on nothing, and the more he asked her to compose herself, the more she wouldn't. Consequently, Mr. Micawber was soon so overcome that he mingled his tears with hers and mine, until he begged me to do him the favour of taking a chair on the staircase while he got her into bed. I would have taken my leave for the night, but he would not hear of my doing that until the stranger's bell should ring. So I sat at the staircase window until he came out with another chair and joined me. "'How is Mrs. Micawber now, sir?' I said. Oh, "'Very low,' said Mr. Micawber, shaking his head. "'Reaction. Ah, this has been a dreadful day. We stand alone now. Everything is gone from us.' Mr. Micawber pressed my hand and groaned, and afterwards shed tears. I was greatly touched and disappointed, too, for I had expected that we should be quite gay on this happy and long-looked-for occasion. But Mr. and Mrs. Micawber were so used to their old difficulties, I think that they felt quite shipwrecked when they came to consider that they were released from them. All their elasticity was departed, and I never saw them half so wretched as on this night, insomuch that when the bell rang, and Mr. Micawber walked with me to the lodge, and parted from me there with a blessing, I felt quite afraid to leave him by himself, he was so profoundly miserable. But through all the confusion and lowness of spirits in which we had been, so unexpectedly to me, involved, I plainly discerned that Mr. and Mrs. Micawber and their family were going away from London, and that a parting between us was near at hand. It was in my walk home that night, and in the sleepless hours which followed when I lay in bed, that the thought first occurred to me, though I don't know how it came into my head, which afterwards shaped itself into a settled resolution. I had grown to be so accustomed to the Micawbers, and had been so intimate with them in their distress, and was so utterly friendless without them, that the prospect of being thrown upon some new shift for a lodging, and going once more among unknown people, was like being that moment turned adrift into my present life, with such knowledge of it ready-made as experience had given me. All the sensitive feelings it wounded so cruelly, all the shame and misery it kept alive within my breast, became more poignant as I thought of this, and I determined that the life was unendurable. That there was no hope of escape from it unless the escape was of my own act I knew quite well. I rarely heard from Miss Murdstone, and never from Mr. Murdstone, but two or three parcels of made or mended clothes had come up for me, consigned to Mr. Quinion and in each there was a scrap of paper to the effect that J. M. trusted D. C. was applying himself to business, and devoting himself wholly to his duties, not the least hint of my ever being anything else than the common drudge into which I was fast settling down. The very next day showed me, while my mind was in the first agitation of what it had conceived, that Mrs. Micawber had not spoken of their going away without warrant. They took a lodging in the house where I lived for a week, at the expiration of which time they were to start for Plymouth. Mr. Micawber himself came down to the counting-house in the afternoon to tell Mr. Quinion that he must relinquish me on the day of his departure, and to give me a high character, which I am sure I deserved. And Mr. Quinion, calling in Tip the carman, who was a married man, and had a room to let, quartered me prospectively on him by our mutual consent, as he had every reason to think, for I said nothing, though my resolution was now taken. I passed my evenings with Mr. and Mrs. Micawber during the remaining term of our residence under the same roof, and I think we became fonder of one another as time went on. On the last Sunday they invited me to dinner, and we had a loin of pork and apple sauce, and a pudding. 
I had bought a spotted wooden horse overnight as a parting gift to little Wilkins Micawber, that was the boy, and a doll for little Emma. I had also bestowed a shilling on the Orfling, who was about to be disbanded. We had a very pleasant day, though we were all in a tender state about our approaching separation. "'I shall never, Master Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'revert to the period when Mr. Micawber was in difficulties without thinking of you. Your conduct has always been of the most delicate and obliging description. You have never been a lodger. You have been a friend.' "'My dear,' said Mr. Micawber, "'Copperfield, for so he had been accustomed to call me of late, has a heart to feel for the distress of his fellow-creatures when they are behind a cloud, and a head to plan, and a hand to, in short, a general ability to dispose of such available property as could be made away with. I expressed my sense of this commendation, and said I was very sorry we were going to lose one another. Uh, my dear young friend, said Mr. Micawber, I am older than you a man of some experience in life, and, and of some experience, in short, in difficulties, generally speaking. At present, and until something turns up, which I am, I may say, hourly expecting, I have nothing to bestow but advice. Still my advice is so far worth taking that, in short, that I have never taken it myself, and am the... Here Mr. Micawber, who had been beaming and smiling all over his head and face up to the present moment, checked himself and frowned. Oh, the miserable wretch you behold! My dear Micawber, urged his wife. I say, returned Mr. Micawber, quite forgetting himself and smiling again, the miserable wretch you behold. My advice is, never do tomorrow what you can do today. A procrastination is the thief of time. Collar him. My poor papa's maxim, Mrs. Micawber observed. My dear, said Mr. Micawber, your papa was very well in his way, and heaven forbid that I should disparage him. Take him for all in all. We ne'er shall, in short, make the acquaintance, probably, of anybody else possessing, at his time of life, the same legs for gaiters and able to read the same description of print without spectacles. But he applied that maxim to our marriage, my dear, and that was so far prematurely entered into, in consequence, that I never recovered the expense. Mr. Micawber looked aside at Mrs. Micawber, and added, oh, Not that I am sorry for it. Quite the contrary, my love. After which he was grave for a minute or so. My other piece of advice, Copperfield, said Mr. Micawber, you know— Annual income twenty pounds, annual expenditure nineteen, nineteen, and six. Result? Happiness. Annual income twenty pounds, annual expenditure twenty pounds, ought and six. Result? Misery. The blossom is blighted, the leaf is withered, the god of day goes down upon the dreary scene, and, and in short, you are forever floored, as I am. To make his example the more impressive, Mr. Micawber drank a glass of punch with an air of great enjoyment and satisfaction, and whistled the college hornpipe. I did not fail to assure him that I would store these precepts in my mind, though indeed I had no need to do so, for at that time they affected me visibly. Next morning I met the whole family at the coach office, and saw them with a desolate heart take their places outside at the back. "'Master Copperfield,' said Mrs. Micawber, "'God bless you. I never can forget all that, you know, and I never would, if I could.' "'Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, "'farewell. Every happiness and prosperity. If, in the progress of revolving years, I could persuade myself that my blighted destiny has been a warning to you, I should feel that I had not occupied another man's place in existence altogether in vain.' In case of anything turning up, of which I am rather confident, I shall be extremely happy if it should be in my power to improve your prospects. I think, as Mrs. Micawber sat at the back of the coach with the children, and I stood in the road looking wistfully at them, a mist cleared from her eyes, and she saw what a little creature I really was. I think so, because she beckoned to me to climb up 
with quite a new and motherly expression in her face, and put her arm round my neck, and gave me just such a kiss as she might have given to her own boy. I had barely time to get down again before the coach started, and I could hardly see the family for the handkerchiefs they waved. It was gone in a minute. The orphling and I stood looking vacantly at each other in the middle of the road, and then shook hands and said good-bye, she going back, I suppose, to St. Luke's workhouse, as I went to begin my weary day at Murdstones and Grinby's. But with no intention of passing many more weary days there, no, I had resolved to run away, to go by some means or other down to the country to the only relation I had in the world, and tell my story to my aunt. Miss Betsy. I have already observed that I don't know how this desperate idea came into my brain, but once there it remained there, and hardened into a purpose than which I have never entertained a more determined purpose in my life. I am far from sure that I believe there was anything hopeful in it, but my mind was so thoroughly made up that it must be carried to execution. Again and again, and a hundred times again, since the night when the thought had first occurred to me and banished sleep, I had gone over that old story of my poor mother's about my birth, which it had been one of my great delights in the old time to hear her tell, and which I knew by heart. My aunt walked into that story, and walked out of it a dread and awful personage. But there was one little trait in her behaviour which I liked to dwell on and which gave me some faint shadow of encouragement. I could not forget how my mother had thought that she had felt her touch her pretty hair with no ungentle hand, and though it might have been altogether my mother's fancy, and might have had no foundation whatever in fact, I made a little picture out of it, of my terrible aunt relenting towards the girlish beauty that I recollected so well and loved so much, which softened the whole narrative. It is very possible that it had been in my mind a long time, and had gradually engendered my determination. As I did not know even where Miss Betsy lived, I wrote a long letter to Peggotty, and asked her, incidentally, if she remembered, pretending that I had heard of such a lady living at a certain place I named at random, and had a curiosity to know if it were the same. In the course of that letter, I told Peggotty that I had a particular occasion for half a guinea, and that if she could lend me that sum until I could repay it, I should be very much obliged to her, and would tell her afterwards what I wanted it for. Peggotty's answer soon arrived, and was, as usual, full of affectionate devotion. She enclosed the half guinea. I was afraid she must have had a world of trouble to get it out of Mr. Barkis's box, and told me that Miss Betsy lived near Dover, but whether at Dover herself, at Hyde, Sandgate, or Folkestone, she could not say. One of our men, however, informing me on my asking him about these places that they were all close together, I deemed this enough for my object, and resolved to set out at the end of that week. Being a very honest little creature, and unwilling to disgrace the memory I was going to leave behind me at Murdstone and Grinby's, I considered myself bound to remain until Saturday night, and, as I had been paid a week's wages in advance when I first came there, not to present myself in the counting-house at the usual hour to receive my stipend. For this express reason I had borrowed the half-guinea, that I might not be without a fund for my travelling expenses. Accordingly, when the Saturday night came, and we were all waiting in the warehouse to be paid, and Tip the carman, who always took precedence, went in first to draw his money, I shook Mick Walker by the hand, asked him when it came to his turn to be paid, to say to Mr. Quinion that I had gone to move my box to Tip's, and bidding a last good-night to mealy potatoes, ran away. My box was at my old lodgings over the water, and I had written a direction for it on the back of one of our address cards that we nailed on the casks. Master David, to be left to call for at the coach office Dover. This I had in my pocket, ready to put on the box, after I should have got it out of the house, and, as I went towards my lodgings, I looked about me for someone who would help me carry it to the booking office. There was a long-legged young man with a very little empty donkey-cart standing near the obelisk in the Blackfriars Road, whose eyes I caught as I was going by, and who, addressing me as Sixpen or the Bad Apens, hoped I should know him again to swear to, in allusion, I have no doubt, to my staring at him. 
I stopped to assure him that I had not done so in bad manners, but uncertain whether he might or might not like a job. "'What job?' said the long-legged young man. "'To move a box,' I answered. "'What box?' said the long-legged young man. I told him mine, which was down that street there, and which I wanted him to take to the Dover coach office for sixpence. "'Done with you for a tanner!' said the long-legged young man, and directly got upon his cart, which was nothing but a large wooden tray on wheels, and rattled away at such a rate that it was as much as I could do to keep pace with the donkey. There was a defiant manner about this young man, and particularly about the way in which he chewed straw as he spoke to me, that I did not much like. As the bargain was made, however, I took him upstairs to the room I was leaving, and we brought the box down and put it in his cart. Now, I was unwilling to put the direction card on there, lest any of my landlord's family should fathom what I was doing and detain me, so I said to the young man that I would be glad if he would stop for a minute, when he came to the dead wall of the King's Bench prison. The words were no sooner out of my mouth than he rattled away as if he, my box, the cart and the donkey were all equally mad, and I was quite out of breath with running and calling after him when I caught him at the place appointed. Being much flushed and excited, I tumbled my half-guinea out of my pocket in pulling out the card. I put it in my mouth for safety, and though my hands trembled a good deal, had just tied the card on very much to my satisfaction, when I felt myself violently chucked under the chin by the long-legged young man, and saw my half-guinea fly out of my mouth into his hand. "'What?' said the young man, seizing me by the jacket collar with a frightful grin. "'This is a polis case, is it? You're a-gone a bolt, are you? Come to the polis, you young warman, come to the polis!' "'You give me back my money, if you please,' said I, very much frightened, "'and leave me alone.' "'Come to the polis,' said the young man. "'You shall prove it yourn to the polis.' "'Give me my box and my money, will you?' I cried, bursting into tears. The young man still replied, "'Come to the polis!' and was dragging me against the donkey in a violent manner, as if there were any affinity between that animal and a magistrate, when he changed his mind, jumped into the cart, sat upon my box, and exclaiming that he would drive to the polis straight, rattled away harder than ever. I ran after him as fast as I could, but I had no breath to call out with, and should not have dared call out now if I had. I narrowly escaped being run over twenty times at least in half a mile. Now I lost him, now I saw him, now I lost him, now I was cut with a whip, now I was shouted at, now down in the mud, now up again, now running into somebody's arms, now running headlong at a post. At length, confused by fright and heat, and doubting whether half London might not by this time be turning out for my apprehension, I left the young man to go where he would with my box and money and panting and crying but never stopping, faced about for Greenwich, which I had understood was on the Dover Road, taking very little more out of the world towards the retreat of my aunt Miss Betsy than I had brought into it on the night when my arrival gave her so much umbrage. End of chapter 12